we'll just wait a few seconds for people to join us. Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on hip replacement surgery. My name is Vicky and I'm your host this evening. Our expert presenter is Mr. Matthew Oliver, consultant trauma and orthopaedic surgeon. This presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during or after the presentation, please do so by using the Q&A icon, which is at the bottom of your screen. This can be done with or without giving your name. Please note that this session is being recorded if you do provide your name. If you'd like to book your consultation, we'll provide contact details at the end of this session. I'll now hand over to Mr Matthew Oliver and you'll hear from me again shortly. Good evening everyone and welcome to the uh, hip replacement surgery webinar. Um, just need to move the slides on now. So. How do we move it on? There we are. So that's me, and um, I'm going to talk to you this evening about the hip replacement and everything involving it. So including this session uh, is uh, all about me to start off with, then about Bennington Hospital and my um, expert orthopaedic consultant colleagues that work here with me. We'll then talk about uh, the causes, symptoms and treatment of osteoarthritis of the hip. Uh, I'll then spend quite a bit of time uh, talking about hip replacement surgery and what's involved, the different types of hip replacement, the surgical journey, the recovery process, the risks and the benefits. And then we'll finish off with some information about patient support tools. These are available to help you with your decision making and to help you review um, the various surgeons that you may wish to, to use to do your hip replacement. Finally, then there'll be the question and answer session. So I look forward to taking those questions later. So um, I was appointed as a consultant trauma and orthopaedic surgeon back in 2010 to East Kent Hospitals. Uh, I started working here at Benenden in 2012. Uh, I've been on an intensive uh, orthopaedic fellowship at the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada between 2009 and 2010 where I was uh, fortunate enough to work for six very experienced, world-renowned hip and knee surgeons. Uh, it was a fantastic experience seeing how the healthcare system works in a different country. Uh, and I uh, carried out quite a lot of hip and knee replacements and revision surgeries on this uh, trip. Uh, when I returned to East Kent in 2010, I started off uh, my hip and knee practice. And I also had to carry out quite a lot of hand surgery in the beginning, but that sort of tailed off these days. And uh, my prime focus is now on primary hip and knee replacements. I do double the national average of hip and knee replacements per year, according to the National Joint Registry. The average hip and knee surgeon does about 50 to 55 of each of those operations per year. And I'm averaging about 200 or so. Uh, according to the NJR report in 2022, um, my stats revealed that I'd had four primary hip replacements revised in 12 years. The latest report of 23 actually says it's five. Interestingly, all of these hip replacements have been of the cementless or uncemented variety, and I'll allude to a bit more detail about that later. So Benenden Hospital, uh, first thing to say is that it's uh, rated as outstanding by the Care Quality Commission. Very difficult to achieve that outstanding rating, and there are very few hospitals that have managed to uh, hold on to this year after year. I definitely agree that it's a leading provider of uh, private hip and knee replacements in Kent and probably in, in England and, and and wider now. So certainly in the last year, we managed to top just over a thousand joint replacements. That's including hip and knees. Uh, it's certainly a very clean and calm environment here. 
there's an excellent work ethic across the board from the, the porters, the cleaners, the, the kitchen staff, the nurses, the scrub team, the, the administrative staff, the pre-assessment. Everybody is very much uh, um, happy to come to work and provide an excellent uh, service. On top of that, you have very experienced physiotherapists and my orthopaedic colleagues here have also got a wealth of experience in um, lower limb uh, degenerative conditions. Consistently, the hospital achieves really high patient satisfaction rates. And this uh, is evidence from Doctify, which is an online platform where patients can leave reviews about the, the hospital in general, uh, individual reviews about surgeons or treatments and um, tests and invest investigations that they've had done. Uh, right from the offset, since I've started working here, the hospital has followed the rapid recovery protocol for hip and knee replacements. This is a multidisciplinary approach to really make the patient journey as comfortable and as smooth as possible. Uh, and it involves the physios, the anaesthetist, the pre-assessment team, everybody's involved. And I'll allude a little bit more about that later. So here's an example of the, the Dr. Five feedback. Um, there's many more on the Benenden Hospital website if you wish to have a look. And some of us have got live profiles on Dr. Five, the actual website itself, where you can read a bit more information about the, the, the hospital and the surgeons. These are my colleagues, there are four of us. We've all worked together in the NHS and Alex Chipperfield's recently left the NHS, but he's still very much uh, part of the team with us here at Benenden. Um, and we've got a wealth of experience amongst the five of us doing uh, quite a large high volume number of hip replacements every year. So the condition, uh, what causes osteoarthritis at the hip? Well, it's a, it's a wear and tear condition, really. Um, it causes the joint to gradually become painful and stiff. There are some risk factors that uh, bring the condition on. Uh, age is one of them, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, when I've replaced broken hips, uh, when the person's had a fall, where some of these patients are in their 80s and 90s. And when we remove the ball from the hip joint, we are fascinated to see that it's actually in tip top shape. Uh, it's the bone that has failed rather than the joint that has failed that has required them to have either half a hip replacement or a full hip replacement. So you can go throughout your life without really being bothered by hip arthritis, but that's lucky. Um, being a, a female, unfortunately, slightly increases your risk of getting an osteoarthritic hip. Being overweight um, or obese definitely increases your chances because you're putting more weight through the joint and it will wear out quicker. You can injure your hip for a sports injury as a younger person. You can chip the bone, damage the cartilage, tear the lining of the joint known as the labrum and if it's left untreated because you just think it's a bit of a groin strain, uh, then uh, that can act as a nidus for the problem to develop uh, later in life. There are other causes of the, the hip failing and becoming arthritic as well, such as avascular necrosis, which is when the blood supply to the femoral head um, becomes temporarily disrupted and sometimes permanently disrupted. Uh, that causes the, the bone to die and the articular cartilage above the bone has no scaffold to support it. So it collapses inwards and the head becomes deformed and misshapen and very painful. Yeah, inflammatory arthritis um, such as rheumatoid, sciatic arthropathy and gout can also give you an arthritic hip. But we don't see very much of that these days because those conditions are so well treated with medications. So the symptoms of osteoarthritis of the hip, <clears throat> well, the first thing I, I believe people notice um, is just a general feeling of stiffness in the groin. They may be seated for a while watching a, a movie or having dinner and they get up, they just have a slight catching sensation and feel that the hip is a little stiff and then it momentarily passes and everything's back to normal again. Some people present with a um, feeling of uh, like a, a groin strain and to go and have some physio and it sort of semi set settles down. But as the condition develops, uh, the pain gradually increases 
um, the stiffness in the joint increases as well. And you'll notice that you can't do some things that you could have done in the past easily, such as put on your shoes and socks and clip your toenails, get in and out of a car, uh, run up the stairs, things like that. As the things move and progress, you'll notice that you'll start to walk with a limp and you won't be able to um, take part in more vigorous activities such as a, a hike or walking around the golf course or or um, other sort of strenuous um, activities. Uh, if you leave your hip too long, um, you'll be significantly um, uh, hampered by it and you may notice it making all sorts of funny noises like a grating or crackling sound that's usually quite an advanced uh, osteoarthritic picture and those patients don't necessarily have that much pain in the groin anymore the pain is transferred to the knee joint of the same limb one thing that you may also notice is that there's some wastage of the muscle around the buttock and uh, the proximal thigh the thigh muscle because you're not moving the hip as well as you once did. Um, so they're the symptoms of osteoarthritis of the hip. The treatment options, uh, there are many. Uh, the main ones to start off with would be lifestyle changes. So modifying your activities, uh, doing less uh, sort of um, heavy duty exercise, more light load bearing exercises, stretches, uh, walking on the flat, no heavy lifting, twisting and things like that. Also, you could look at your diet and try and lose some weight. Um, pain medication is available and you can start off with the basic um, over the counter stuff like paracetamol and then gradually climb up the pain ladder getting prescription only medications. Uh, ones that we commonly see patients use are cocodamol and naproxen. These are, are good uh, analgesics and take the edge off the pain and keep people quite mobile, but eventually they stop working or, or become less effective. Opioids or opiate morphine-based analgesia should only be used as a last resort. It usually means that the hip is extremely arthritic and uh, the, the patient urgently needs to be reviewed. Uh, I wouldn't want my patients to be on morphine really by the time I get to see them for the first time. Steroid injection. I don't use these very regularly uh, as a pain relieving modality. I use it for diagnostic purposes in my practice. Um, some of my colleagues do uh, do use them though, and they, they, they inject the hip under x-ray control in theatre. You can also use an interventional radiologist these days to inject the hip for for us um, down in uh, the radiology department. Uh, there's a caveat with steroid injections. If you do have one, you can't really have a hip replacement for six months as there's scientific evidence to suggest that it increases the risk of getting an infection uh, if you have a hip replacement too soon after these injections. TENS machines, I... I, I don't really have much experience of using TENS machines in my practice, but I can understand that they theoretically may help. Hot packs um, and ice packs. Certainly a heated pack is quite soothing after a busy day if you've got a, a throbbing joint. Ice packs are more uh, used after the uh, hip replacement to take the, the swelling down. Uh, definitely some benefit in using a stick held, held in the opposite hand so the opposite leg. Uh, so if you've got an arthritic left hip, you hold it in your right hand. This reduces the joint reaction force through the um, poorly leg and therefore takes quite a bit of the discomfort away. Physiotherapy is important um, to keep the musculature around the hip joint in good condition and also to keep it as flexible as possible. Uh, <clears throat> eventually, uh, the, the patient will require hip replacement surgery. So the better the muscles, the better co the condition the muscles are in preoperatively, the swifter and the better the functional outcome will be postoperatively. It's the, 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 the term that's coined as prehabilitation, and I'll talk about that a bit more in detail later. So uh, hip replacement and joint fusion are the surgical options. Uh, 
the joint fusion procedure i haven't done that as a consultant i've been involved with one or two many many years ago in my training very rarely done these days the hip replacement is such a reliable functional um operation to sort out hip arthritis that nothing else really is required so th this is an interesting slide with some demographics on it uh, I was just thinking about this the other day in preparation for tonight. So the 47% of hip procedures or hip replacements were done in independent hospitals in the UK in 2022, according to the National Joint Registry. I think that's partly due to the recovery from the COVID pandemic, where a lot of um, hip replacements were transferred to the independent sector because the NHS waiting lists were you know, very... Um, very lengthy and as they still are in some trusts but also i think it's due to, be, to the fact that a hip replacement and a knee replacement are very suited to an independent hospital and the processes uh, and the pathways that they offer uh, it, it's a good environment to have the procedure done in uh, it's an elective unit usually with all the white noise of trauma and headaches of bed allocation and emergencies all removed. It's a calm and uh, controlled environment to, to come and have uh, what is essentially a tyre change sorted out for you. So um, uh, nearly 100,000 hip replacements were performed in the UK in 2022, again, according to the National Joint Registry. So it's a, a very common procedure. Um, it was coined the operation of the century at the end of the last millennium, the total hip replacement, because it, it has provided such instant gratification to so many people that were crippled prior to having the operation. It's got them out of the wheelchair. It's got them to ditch the crutches and the stick and to get back on, uh, to a good quality of life. Um, it's also been uh, voted the second best operation in the world, uh, according to studies that looked at quality adjusted life years. This is a quantitative and qualitative study that works out the benefit of an operation to someone with giving them their, their life back, so to speak. The top one I always thought was cardiac surgery, followed second by cataract surgery and then hip and then knee. But I've, I stand corrected if uh, this statement in front of me says it's the second best certainly in the top four anyway. And I agree that the vast majority of patients are very happy once they've had their surgery performed. You can see that the uh, number one indication for a hip replacement is osteoarthritis or the wear and tear condition. 91% of our patients have this condition. The other percentage um, is due to trauma, 5%. And uh, the other 4% are the rare oddities such as uh, avascular necrosis or inflammatory arthritis. 60% um, of the cases uh, are ladies and the average age is about 68, 69. Uh, the average body mass index is 28.7. I think this is on the rise, sadly, um, and uh, we need to try and get... Uh, message out to primary care of health prevention to try and keep the uh, body mass index in check. So what is a hip replacement? There's, there's a very basic diagram of one there showing you all the relevant parts. So you have a shell or an acetabular component that's usually uh, in the modern era made of titanium and it has a grit blasted surface of um, hydroxyapatite on it or plasma uh, and that encourages your natural bone to recognize it and then your natural bone grows into it over a period of a few months while that process is happening it has to be press fit firmly into the natural acetabular socket and we prepare the socket carefully to ensure that happens inside the shell or the, or the acetabular component goes a plastic liner the one that I like to use with the G7 shell here at Benenden has vitamin E in it. And that's supposed to sweep up all the free radicals in the area, uh, which um, helps preserve the, uh, the, the plastic or polyethylene and means that it doesn't corrode or 
or uh, degregate so quickly. And then you have the femoral stem. That's normally made out of titanium if it's a press fit stem. And again, it's coated in hydroxyapatite or porous coating. The stems are the, for cemented use are usually made out of cobalt, chrome, and they're highly polished. Uh, you have different femoral heads. The, the ones that are commonly used here at Benenden are made out of ceramic. Uh, you can also have a cobalt, chrome, or a metal head, and they come in various sizes depending on the size of the socket used. So how do you know if you need a hip replacement? Well, it's the light bulb moment. Um, basically, you'll know yeah, the bad days outnumber the good. Your quality of life is on the slide. You're not enjoying your activities. You can't go dancing, can't play golf. You can't really walk very far. You're taking painkillers regularly. You're limping. You've got pain at night. Um, all of these are... Um, the criteria to consider going to the next step. If you have any uh, indecision, there are some decision-making tools available out there. And one that I use in the clinic is called the Oxford Hip Score, which is a validated scoring system that looks at the function of a patient of an arthritic hip. And it gives just gives you a, a yardstick as to where you are in, in, on, on a spectrum. If you score 48, then you're in tip-top shape if you're scoring 10 or less you're likely to be wheelchair bound uh, and some scientific research has been done to suggest the optimum score to consider having a hip replacement it's around 26 to 28 so these are the types of hip replacement i've already talked about this a little bit um but a bit more detail so the, the picture uh, with the pink femoral head that's a ceramic femoral head and the implant there is called the Coral Pinnacle uh, Hip Replacement Implant, which is commonly used here at Benenden. It is um, made by the company Pew and uh, is uh, freely available throughout the world. It's an extremely popular hip replacement with an excellent clinical heritage and survivorship. It is um, a press fit hip and it rests on the the uh, the the cut uh, on the top of the femur with that collar that you can see there, and that gives it rotational stability, uh, and over time your bone bonds with it. Uh, the other hip on the uh, the shiny hip on the top uh, left of the, my screen is a, a cemented hip replacement. There's a highly polished stem there, and I think that's the Exeter hip. Uh, and you can see it's got a little um, centralizer at the bottom there to ensure that it goes in the correct position in the patient's femoral canal. So the cement goes around it in an even manner. Uh, that's known as a cement mantle. The other hip replacement used here regularly at Benenden is the taper lock system with the G7 shell. That's my favorite one. And that's been around for many, many years with excellent clinical survivorship. We decide whether we should cement or use an uncemented hip really on how good the patient's bone is. If the, the patient's bone is parotic uh, or soft, and that's quite commonly the case with ladies over the age of 65 due to the changes that happen at the menopause, your body, your bone uh, density gradually reduces. Um, then it's uh, best practice according to various guidelines like the National Institute of Clinical Excellence to, to use a cemented femoral stem. The, uh, the shell doesn't have to be cemented. It, you can still have an uncemented press fit acetabular component that works well. Um, <clears throat> so what's involved during a hip replacement? You uh, have to have a, an anaesthetic. Usually it's a spinal anaesthetic where you have a needle in the back, which numbs you from that level downwards. You are then offered sedation and you can be completely out for the count or completely awake or in between. It's up to you and you just need to liaise with your anaesthetist who will be by your side throughout. It takes about an hour or an hour and a half, depending if you use a cemented femur, because it takes about 12 minutes for the cement to set. Uh, you're in hospital for about one to two nights. And you can see on, on that thigh there, the surgical scar. 
So what's involved during the surgery? So once you're anaesthetized, you're positioned carefully on the table lying on your side and you're held in place by um, pelvic positioners that stabilize your pelvis so it doesn't move. We then uh, approach the hip with a, a surgical approach and the various ones of those that are practiced here at Benenden, and that's dependent on the surgeon's skill and their preference. They all essentially have the same aim, and that is to get into the hip joint safely so we can dislocate it safely without causing any further harm. Once the ball is dislocated out of the socket, it is removed with a saw, and then we start the preparation of the acetabulum by tidying up all of the cartilage that sits around the, the rim of the acetabulum, that's called the labrum. We then use stepwise greater remus to uh, gradually increase the size of the acetabulum and the shape to ensure it's hemispherical. And then we put trial components in, and so we have a tight press fit. And when we're happy that it's a tight press fit, we put the real component in and carefully position it so it's not uh, it has to be positioned extremely carefully because if it's too open or closed or pointing the wrong way, it can cause the hip later to dislocate. Once we're happy with that, we then click in the, uh, the plastic liner and move our attention to the femur. The femur is prepared in a similar manner using uh, stepwise progressive sizes of um, brooches to shape the femoral canal to get a press fit if we're using an uncemented hip or to um, get a, a reasonable press fit for the, the trial femoral component if we're going to use a cemented hip. Once we've got the trial femur in place, we then try different offsets. That means uh, looking at different femoral neck angles to ensure that the muscle tension in the hip is balanced and like the native hip once was, we want to try and replicate the native hip biomechanics. We then pop a ball on top of the offset trunnion and then reduce the hip back into the new socket. It's then put through a range of motion um, to make sure it doesn't dislocate. Leg lengths are checked and uh, muscle tension is checked. And if we're happy, we'll ask our scrub nurse to provide us with the real deal, which are the sizes that we've just trialled, and then they'll be fixed in place, either tapped in if it's uncemented or grouted or cemented in if it's a cemented hip replacement. So here's some post-operative x-rays. Um, the, the, the pelvic x-ray showing both hips uh, that reveals a hybrid hip replacement on both sides. The femoral stems have been cemented in place and the sockets or acetabular components have been press fit. You can see that the the uh, the light grey fluffy sort of appearance around the, the white femoral stems, that's the bone cement. And there's good interdigitation there with the bone and the implant. Um, and you can see that the the acetabular components are well positioned and there's no fresh air between them and the, the bone behind them. So they're, they're firmly fixed in or press fit in. And on the other side, that shows you the corral pinnacle hip replacement, which is the uncemented version. You can see the collar at the top of the femoral component resting on the top of the femur. That gives it an initial rotational stability and stops it from sinking while your bone grows into it. <clears throat> so the recovery period, well, if you've had your operation in the morning, it would be fantastic by lunchtime or just after lunch to, to take your first steps and the physios will be keen to try and achieve this with you. Um, your first steps will be with um, a frame and then you'll rapidly progress to crutches. And uh, you should have confidence that you should be able to put full weight through the hip once your leg has woken up. You will have some discomfort, but the modern anaesthetic techniques uh, mean that it shouldn't be too bad the first day or so. Uh, most patients in the recovery suite after the operation uh, have uh, an extra injection placed into their hip joint known as a fascia iliaca block, which uh, 
prolongs the um, the pain relief following the spinal anesthetic, and it works really well. Physiotherapy will then progress you through a series of different exercises uh, where we'll wean you off the the frame to crutches. You'll be doing the stairs and being shown some exercises to do on the bed. Uh, you, you'll have an x-ray on your first post-operative day, hopefully, as well as a set of blood tests to make sure that your, your full blood count and your kidney function are all satisfactory. You should be eating normal food again and, and being quite comfortable. Pain relief is available uh, on your drug chart and you'll be nursed one-to-one. -one. You should receive physio at least twice uh, each day that you're on the ward with us here. Your surgeon should see you on the first post-operative day as well, along with the um, the RMO or the resident medical officer that looks after the ward. We'll only let you leave once you're safe uh, and we'll provide you with some extra kits such as a toilet seat raise and a frame and crutches if needed. As mentioned earlier, you'll be shown to how to safely go up and down the stairs. <clears throat> It's ideal that once you get home, that you've had a, you've already organised some physiotherapy. Um, depending on what pathway you've chosen to to go through with um, Benenden to have your hip, the physio and, and if you live reasonably locally, you'll be able to use the physio service here. If you're more out of area, I'd certainly recommend either through your NHS GP or if you can do it privately, uh, setting yourself up with a physio for one-to-one -one from about the first week or so post-op, just seeing them once a week to check in to make sure you hit the milestones because it really does make a big difference. You should be starting to wean yourself off the painkillers after the first couple of weeks. However, in the first couple of weeks, especially, you'll feel very tired. And this is the time to just recharge the batteries eat and drink well and just concentrate on your exercises. You'll notice that your leg will be swollen and you'll be bruised from your buttock, sometimes all the way down to your little toe. That's quite normal. It's partly due to the trauma of the operation and partly due to the blood thinning medication that we give you for a couple of weeks um, to reduce the risk of uh, deep vein thrombosis. Um, I use dissolvable stitches in my practice, so I'd require my patients just to have the dressing changed at about seven days at their GPs for a fresh one. And then uh, you shouldn't have to worry about anything else after that because the stitches will just dissolve. By six weeks, you should be walking around the house with a crutch or furniture walking. And outside, you're probably still on a crutch or two crutches. You should be able to, to start driving your car again and you'll have a follow-up appointment with your surgeon where you'll have your wound checked and your milestones checked to make sure you're progressing satisfactorily. I would say it takes a minimum of about three months to get over the hip placement to enable you to return to activities such as playing golf, swimming, and more energetic activities. <clears throat> so a life after a hip replacement is pretty good on the whole. There's always going to be a few patients that unfortunately have some chronic pain, but the, la the vast majority of people, their lives are transformed and uh, they're so much better. Um, you have to be a little bit careful uh, with some of the activities that you do, especially if you put your hip in positions that risk it dislocating. However, with the modern hip implants and good surgical technique, I'm quite happy to remove virtually all hip restrictions and precautions after about six to eight weeks. <clears throat> High impact activities, and I'd count, count those, I guess, as contact sports and skiing are certainly at the patient's own risk. And um, it's a risk stratification exercise, really. You have to remember that it's an artificial implant and uh, it can only take so much. Uh, if you look after it, it will hopefully look after you for many, many years. Um, yeah. So the risks, 
you have the usual surgical risks of blood clots in the leg and the lung, DVT and PE. So we give you blood thinners with Roxaban usually for a month. Loosening of the joint means it wears out, but with modern implants, you should get at least 15 to 20 years of longevity, everything being equal. It can dislocate, so it's down to surgical technique, making sure the implants are appropriately positioned and the, the correct size. And it's down to the patient not cutting corners and doing anything too silly in the first few weeks. There is a risk of um, leg length discrepancy. We normally can get your leg within about a centimetre of the upper leg. Sometimes it has to be lengthened if the muscle tension is poor, but that's usual, unusual. <clears throat> infection is a risk. And the national average for a deep infection of a hip joint is just over 1%. And I'd say at Benenden, it's closer to 0% than 1%. This is an extremely clean um, environment to have your hip replacement carried out in and um, very, very, very low rate of infection. You can get some damage to nerves, which can cause a foot drop that normally recovers. Um, you can bleed and may need to have a blood transfusion, but it's unlikely these days. The bone can be broken during the operation, but we have the uh, the kit on the shelf to deal with this if we have to. Um, you can also break it if you are to stumble, <clears throat> and uh, so you have to be extremely careful in the first six weeks. Um, revision. If you're around the age of 70 and you have your hip replaced and everything goes to plan, it's unlikely that you'll need to ever worry about having a hip revision. But unfortunately, sometimes you can get an infection elsewhere in the body that travels to the hip that causes it to go wrong. And in the younger generation, sort of the 50 to 60 year old group, where they're more active on their hip, it is likely to not last them their lifetime. That said, there's some hip replacements that are in people that are 40 plus years old now and they're still going strong. These are the decision support tools that are out there in the public domain. You can look us up on the NJR surgeon's profile. That's going to have more information uh, added to it as um, it evolves, but you can look at our mortality rates. It should be almost zero for elective surgery. You can see the volume of operation that we carry out and where we operate and uh, other sort of demographics are on there. Then you have the private healthcare independent network or FIN. This has evolved over the last four or five years and uh, you can now look at um, the surgeon's reviews on here now and where we, we work and our prices and um, there's a lot of information on there. And then you've got the various review sites such as Doctify, Top Doctors, um, IWantGreatCare.com. And then finally, you've got the, the, the web address there. You can see uh, that takes you to a, a scoring uh, question and answer tool that helps sort of make your mind up whether you need a hip replacement or not. So now we're going to move on to the question and answer session. I hope you found that informative and thank you for listening so far. Thank you, Mr. Oliver, for that interesting presentation. Um, we'll now take some questions. Um, so we've got um, plenty of time, so please do um, ask away. Um, the first question is from Susan. Um, Susan's asking, with sedation, are you aware of what's going on? Um, it all depends on the level of sedation. Uh, if it's very mild, then you are aware you can hear some of the background music that's in the, going on or the surgeon and the anaesthetist talking and you can hear some some of the instruments being used. But if that distresses you, 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 you can let the anaesthetist know knowing the level of sedation can be increased. Thank you. Um... And uh, Susan Oscar asks again, um, she had spinal surgery 30 years ago at L4-5, uh, removal of ruptured disc and fusion of joints. Um, will there be a problem with the epidural? This, um, this is an interesting question. Um, it's normally best to ask the anaesthetist this question at your pre-assessment. However, I do know that the Spinal anaesthetic is usually administered at a higher level than L4, L5, around L2. 
So it should bypass that problem uh, and it should still be able to be uh, effective. Lovely, thank you. Um, Carol asks, do you have to wait uh, six months um, as she's had a fluoroscopy injection? If you've had a steroid injection into the hip, um, either through fluoroscopy or ultrasound guided, then it's best practice to wait six months before having the hip replacement. Uh, yeah, there is some evidence out there to show that if you have it done too soon, then you could have an infection in your hip. You have to wait for the steroid to, to go away, I guess. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody's asked here, is running considered a high risk uh, sport post-surgery? I think you can uh, definitely get back to a bit of jogging, but I don't think you'll be able to run uh, um, or sprint or anything like that, any any significant distance. Um, it, 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 yeah, you should be able to jog after a hip replacement. It depends on the age and uh, the patient and um what the other hips up to and aches and pains elsewhere but the more cycles you put your hip through the quicker it will wear out so you just have to be mindful of that okay some words for all the runners out there um somebody else has asked am i able to have a hip replacement within a year of a knee replacement no problem yep that can be done okay it's nice and simple um Paul has asked, after the surgery, will the patient be able to sleep much during the night? Um, in the hospital, you mean? Mm. The first night post-op is a challenging one for the patients because they have to wear foot pumps on their feet that bleep every five minutes. They squeeze the calf muscles um, to try and reduce uh, the risk of deep vein thrombosis um, and they, they disturb the patient's sleep the first night. You can request to have them removed at your own risk, and they're only used until you get mobile. Once you've started to walk about, they can be discarded. Okay, thank you. Um, just going back to um, post-op activity, Jennifer's asked, is yoga considered a risky activity post-op? Uh, I think uh, some of the positions in yoga you'd have to be careful with. Um, I don't practice yoga myself, but I know you can get yourself into all sorts of shapes and positions. So, But, um, yeah, I think you can get back to yoga. As long as your yoga instructor knows you've had a hip replacement, then it can be tailored to you, the, the yoga course. <clears throat> yeah, it makes sense. Um, somebody has asked, um, I've been diagnosed with moderate osteoarthritis three years ago on my hip, but I only have pain in my knee, which locks up when I sit down for a while. I cannot now put on a shoe on my right foot or cut my toenails, etc. Is this my hip or my knee? I, I've got a strong suspicion that that's your hip. Um, when your knee stiffens up, you should still be able to cut your toenail. Um, it's the lack of hip flexion that prevents us from getting down to our feet. Uh, and when the hip arthritis is bad, the, a lot of the pain is transferred to the knee. Okay, that's just for today. Thank you. Um, Judith asks, my pain is more in my buttock and leg, yet my consultant thinks it's coming from my hip. I have bone on bone arthritis and now need a hip replacement. Is it really possible that the excruciating pain in my buttock is from my hip? Everything else has been ruled out. It's very likely to be the case that it's your hip joint that's causing that pain. Yeah. Okay. Right. Hopefully that's helpful, Judith. Um, somebody's asked, how long post surgery should you avoid stairs? Oh, you can. Uh, I don't want you to avoid stairs. You, we, 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 we practice you on the stairs uh, as soon as you're able to manage your crutches. The physios will get you to run up and down the staircase with them. Not literally run up and down, but they'll give you lots of practice. So yeah, stairs are fine. If you've got lots of, uh, if you've got a tricky staircase at home and you have the ability to have ground floor living, then. That may be the safest bet, but please practice the stairs every day until you get competent at them. Okay, some good advice. I thank you. Um, Michael's asked, I have a low platelet count. Would this complication be a problem for Benden Hospital? It just depends on how low is low. Um, uh, we don't have any uh, medical backup here, but if it was, I think um, if you have a platelet count of 80 or less, it's quite risky to do a spinal anaesthetic. 
because you can have a hematoma in your spine. Um, so you may need to have a platelet transfusion and that might be challenging to arrange at Benenden because uh, they they come as a fresh frozen packet. So getting the timing of surgery is going to be a bit challenging. So that might be challenging, something to put to the anaesthetists. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, Kyrene, I hope I pronounced that correctly, asks, can you sleep on the operated hip post-operation? Ideally, you should sleep on your back for the first six weeks. And I don't recommend my patients sleep on their operative side for about three months because it can flare up the scar. Um, and it's uncomfortable during the healing process. So after six weeks, I'm happy for them to sleep on the non-operative side of a pillow between their knees, which stops their legs from crossing over. Okay, great, lovely, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I've got quite a lot of sporty people on the webinar tonight. So Ken's asking, and um, what about Pilates and cycling? I assume Ken is cycling's fine. Yeah. yeah, they should be able to get back to a good good level of cycling. Pilates, similar answer to the yoga, really. You have to just let your instructor know and be careful with the the hyperflexion uh, manoeuvres, I guess. But I shouldn't think it'd be a problem. OK. Uh, and on that same theme, um, Dickon asks, I play national, international table tennis for over 40s and over 60s. Can I return to this intensive activity? I think you can, yeah. That should be OK. Right. It's good to hear. Um, just a couple more questions. So Robert has asked, when I saw the anaesthetist, he put my operation on hold out some concern for my heart. This has been investigated through the NHS. This is common amongst patients. Um, unfortunately, it's not common, but unfortunately, because of the location of Benenden and the fact that uh, we don't have any high dependency uh, unit facilities and um, medical on call services, then uh, you need to really be in good medical shape, a good, good, you know, tip-top shape to have your operation here. If the heart condition can be sorted out, such as an irregular heartbeat made regular again, or a pacemaker can be fitted, and then uh, then you can return to Benenden. But if if you've got significant comorbidities, it is better off having your operation in the NHS of all the medical backup. Okay. Great, hopefully that's helpful. Um, <clears throat> last question we've got here is, I've been told by an NHS consultant I'm too young, at 57, to have a hip replacement as I need a revision in later life and revisions don't go well. What's your view? Um, I think if your hip is very worn out at 57, it would be miserable to leave you in that state to wait until you're, say, 50, 67. It would be just not fair. Um, you know, you only, you only have one life and you want to enjoy your life and uh, pick up the pieces later. So, yeah, at 57, it, your hip replacement may not outlive you, but you would have had a really good life while you're waiting for it to wear out. And I would have my hip replaced at 57 if I needed it. OK, lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, if anyone's got any other questions, um, sorry if we didn't answer them. If you provided your name, we'll answer them via email. And Mr. Oliver, if you could move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so as a thank you for joining this session, we are offering you 50% off the value of your initial consultation. Call back from your dedicated private patient advisor. Um, an email tomorrow with a recording of this session and further information on how to book and updates on news and future events at the hospital. If you'd like to discuss or book your consultation, our private patient team can take your call until 8 p.m. tonight or between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday using the number on the screen. We'd be grateful if you could complete the survey when this session closes to improve our future events. Our next webinar is on lower limb sports injuries, which you can sign up to on our website. So on behalf of Mr. Oliver and our expert team at Benenden Hospital, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us today and we hope to hear from you very soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.